final shall be binding. Good afternoon, India. You hear everything? Wait, wait, wait. Before we start, I'd like to introduce you. I'm just waiting. Okay. I just wait for Kishore, sir. Yes, do so. Sir, could we start, sir? Should we yeah, wait yeah, for yeah. Please start. I think Rachna would be doing it first. Okay. So, most respected, distinguished speaker of today's session, Rosa Dickel. Mueller was a PhD and is an assistant professor in Austria. Uh, her education in 1992, she had a degree in physical education, geography, and computer science. PhD in sport pedagogy, with specializing in aging and physical activity. 1993 to 98, she was a teacher in school, and 1993 to 2001, university assistant an assistant professor at the University of Vienna, Sports Sciences. Her research and teaching focus, sports pedagogy, didactics, gender and diversity studies, health promotion. Her various positions have been vice president of the International Association of Physical Education and Sports for Girls and Women from 2017 to 2021. Presently, she's the vice president, chair of the ICSP International Committee of Sport Pedagogy, Vice President of the OSC Austrian Association for Sports Science, Sport Pedagogy, member of the Scientific Advisory Board uh, of the Austrian Women Forum of Physical Education. Her eng engagements include co founder of the Austrian Platform in Sport for Platform Women in Sports, member of the Scientific Advisory Board of 100 Persons Sport, the Austrian Center for Gender Competence in Sport member of the Austrian Steering Group on Gender Equality in Sports from 2014 to 2020, Chair of the Working Group of Prevention of Sexual Harassment, Gender-Based Violence in Sports since 2015, member of the European Expert Pool on Sexual Violence in Sports since 2018, partner in various several European projects, Erasmus Project Cases from 2019-2021. Erasmus Project Voice, Voices of Truth and Dignity, Combating Sexual Violence in European Sport through Voices of Those Affected 2000-2018. SMS Sports Media Stereotypes and uh, UNAPA Passive Aging and Physical Activity, uh, Tenapa Lena Impala, that is Leisure Time Activity Promotion. Gender-Based Violence in Sport 2016 Project. She conducted several nationally funded projects in the area of gender equality, promotion of women and girls in sport. Kindergarten, physical activity for girls and boys in outdoor areas of kindergarten, school yards and gender relation. Vogos, women's sport goes school in different sports, sexual harassment and discrimination in sport, gender training for coaches. Furthermore, she is the member of several editorial boards, currently for the Austri Austrian Journal, especially for female PE teachers, girls in physical education. On behalf of the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, Halo India, lecture by National College of Physical Education, a warm welcome to Rosa Dickel-Muir. Indeed, we are honored because we were, we were just wanting to have somebody to speak on this particular topic. I appreciate that you readily volunteered for it when you came as a panelist. Indeed, it's an honor and a blessing for us. I'm sure with your session, definitely things might change. So on behalf of everybody, once again, a welcome to Rosa. A warm welcome to you. I'd like to welcome all the other panelists. Dr. Darling Kluka, um, Marlin, Beatrice, Dr. G. Kishore, other invited guests, and all of my dear teachers, and the other guests to this particular session. Once again, a warm welcome to you, and over to you, Rosa, for the session, please. Thank you, Ucha, so much for your nice introduction. Now I know what I have done the last years. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, India. Uh, um, it's a pleasure and an honor for me being invited in this really prestigious and in this really 
outstanding session and seminar uh, where you can reach so many people not only in India but also all over the world. It's really a great idea and very much very important for sport and sports science. Um, and thank you also for the introduction just to let you know um, I'm coming from Vienna and this is the capital from Austria. Just to let you know, this is a very small country. Whole Austria has 9 million inhabitants, so we are really small in comparison to India. Uh, I was asked from Usha to talk about a serious topic which occurs in sports as well. And uh, I'd like to speak about the consequences uh, which this topic has on safeguarding in sport. And as a member of the European Expert Pool on Sexual Harassment in Sport, I tried to focus in my presentation about safeguarding on different issues. Uh, on the one hand, on myths, there are lots of myths uh, concerning the issue, if it is true or not, if it's relevant, uh, if children say the truth and so on. Uh, on the second topic, I'd like to focus on different definitions because there are lots of differences between abuse, harassment, and what it means um, to speak about safeguarding and protecting children in sports. Uh, then I'd like to focus on standards for safeguarding children in sport uh, and focus at the end on models of good practice and projects which um, where it's not important just to focus on sexual harassment but also on policies promoting women and girls in sports as well um, and i'd like to end with some useful resources there are, this topic is very innovative this topic is very actual and there are lots of resources in the internet in on the website uh, which you can use to promote um, safeguarding children in sport and which you can transfer into your organization and, in, and into in your respect. Uh, the IOC uh, made a consens consensus statement on harassment, harassment and abuse in sport in 2016 and the important uh, point is that all athletes have a right to be treated with respect, protected from non-accidental violence, as it is incumbent upon all stakeholders in sport, both to adopt general principles for sport, for safe sport, and to implement and monitor policies and procedures for safe sport, um, showing that um, respect uh, is a, an important value and being protected from this non-accidental violence is crucial also in not only in sports organizations but in all other fields and settings. Uh, in the following I'd like to bring some quotes and sentences and before answering the myth I'd like to I'd, I'd like you to think about if this is false or true. Coming to the first myth Harassment and abuse occur in sport. False or true? Um, the answer on my topic seems to be easy. Harassment and abuse occurs in sport. This is true. And despite the numerous well-recognized benefits of sports participation, it's really good being uh, involved in sports. Evidence indicates that harassment and abuse is an issue in all sports and at all levels. Um, this may be compounded by lack of regula regulatory policies and procedures in sports organizations. So there are a lot of studies going around by Marx, Marcos in 2011, where, um, for example, sexual harassment and abuse in sports and the role of team doctor published in the British Journal of Sports indicated this very clear, this is not a phenomenon which does not occur in sport. Maybe 2017 was an important year on this issue. Maybe you know, have also heard about the Me Too campaign in sports. This was a campaign, a social media campaign, um, which existed before, but in this amount, it was not used and it was not used for the sports um, area. 
Uh, and normally in this way, uh, famous actresses and politicians took the lead, but also athletes followed this example. And the result was a tremendous number of affected persons telling the stories publicly. This was the new aspect. Uh, but also critique and questions occurred why affected persons did not react and tell the stories earlier. This was very interesting discourse in the public. Um, and in 2017, the case of Maroni uh, brought this uh, social media um, campaign going on. Uh, and she, she spoke about that people should know it's not just happening in Hollywood. It's, this is happening everywhere. And wherever there is a position of power, there seems to be a potential uh, for abuse. I had a dream to go to the Olympics and the things that I had to endure to get there were unnecessary and disgusting. Maruni uh, was multiple gold medal awarded gymnast and she was repeatedly molested by a national team doctor. So uh, this was the starting point of this Me Too campaign and uh, it went all over the world and it made clear that it's important to have a look on the systems in sport and on the structures in sport um, to be aware of and to be sensitive for this issue. Another sentence and quote is harassment and abuse do not occur in my sport. What do you think? It's true or false? It's, of course, false. There is a study by Fasting, Breckenridge and Borchen in 2004, uh, which demonstrate that harassment and abuse occurs in all sports. And that, I quote, assumptions about the risk of sexual harassment being higher in some sports than others lead not only to distorted stereotypes, but also to incorrectly targeted policies for harassment free sport. So uh, be aware that each sport could be a field of um, sexual violence, sexual harassment, harassment and abuse at all. And it's more, it's more necessary to look to the structures, to the persons, to the persons' interest in these organizations. Um, and this is uh, the issue. Another quote, harassment and abuse in sport only occur in certain countries. True or false? Of course, it's false. There, are, there is a number of studies which have demonstrated that harassment and abuse occur in sport and is also worldwide. There are studies from uh, Canada, studies from Europe, studies from Australia, and so on, which um, makes clear that it's the structure and the system, how sports organizations work, how persons in trust work where it's possible. To make it clear, sports is a field like others where uh, this issue occurs, but in sport it doesn't occur more often or more frequently than in other areas, it's to make it clear. If you, another quote, if you have never had a reported case of harassment and abuse, this issue doesn't concern us. This sentence is false. Because of not having reported cases of harassment and abuse does not mean that these have never occurred. Indeed, Kirby in her study noted that if effective harassment policies are not in place, cases of maltreatment may not only be underreported, but may also be less likely to be investigated. It depends on the culture and the atmosphere in an organization within a setting, uh, if it's possible to speak up, if it's possible to speak about, and it needs a culture of um, and an atmosphere where it's possible to speak up that also things which are not very nice and which are not um, good for different persons, if there is an atmosphere of speaking up. And one of the suggestions and recommendations is to uh, develop a culture where it's possible to speak, where it's possible to criti criticize aspects which are not fair, which are not transparent. So creating a culture, a good culture, an open culture, a transparent culture is one of the main 
aspect if you want to deal and tackle uh, sexual abuse or abuse and harassment in sports um, at all. Harassment and abuse is not a problem for elite athletes. False or true? It's false. As studies have demonstrated an increased risk of harassment and abuse at the highest performance levels. For example, the study of Kirby, um, which, which uh, was a publication on the title The Dome of Silence, uh, where it got clear that the kind of silence speaking up um, influences if um, this problem is also um, in the area of elite athletes. Or fasting, Bretton, Rich and Knorri analyzed, for example, um, the prevalence of sexual harassment and violence among female athletes in Europe. And they were looking at the performance levels and they, um, the results showed that um, the higher the level is, uh, the more silent people get because they have a high interest in being successful at Olympics. They're very interested in going to championships and they won't lose this opportunity um, at this moment. So that is, that is not to say, however, that it, it, elite athletes are the only ones at risk. Of course, also other groups are, have, um, um, are at risk as well. Um, at least safeguarding should concern everyone working in sport, true or false. As you imagine, this is a sentence which is highly true uh, and uh, which focuses on the standards of um, safeguarding as well, that everyone involved in organized sports shares the responsibility to adhere to the principle of safe sports through best practice and the implementation and adherence of safeguarding policies. I'd focus on this issue a bit later um, as well. Um, when it comes to the definitions of um, safeguarding and the definitions of, of violence and so on. The last one, elite athletes with impairment have a lower risk of harassment and abuse. In um, the world, in, in the, lots of people say uh, people who suffer from impairment have no risk or lower risk, that's false. Uh, research indicates that athletes with disabilities have an increased risk of abuse compared to their avid bodied counterparts. So there are many reasons for this. One reason uh, could be daily care needs, for example, for para-athletes, uh, and in trying to meet those needs, roles and responsibilities among athletes, entourage can become blurred, increasing the risk of maltreatment. So. Um, also, in this case, it doesn't matter if you are um, an abled and disabled uh, person, there is a risk for being harassed or abused in sports as well. So coming to uh, research data on sexual violence in sports, there was a, come, I'm coming to European data, for example, in the European project Sport Respect Your Rights in 2015. Um, there was a uh, sentence of one out of five athletes has experienced some form of sexual violence in sport. The German study by Bettina Rulofs in 2016 pointed out that one out of three German squad athletes have experienced some form of sexual violence in sport. This could be physical, emotional, psychological as well, but she was, was, was also, um, Astonishing, at least most of the um, officials in sport, was that one out of nine German athletes experienced severe sexual violence, such as sexual assault or rape. And this is a high number. Coming to the general data uh, for European situation, one out of four girls and one out of six boys have been sexually abused by their 18th birthday. I've read about data from India and the numbers were very high that seven out of 10 experienced sexual violence and more than 90% uh, 
have uh, experienced any forms of sexual violence, if women have experienced any forms of sexual violence. I don't know if these data are true, I got it from the internet, but there is a high need for thinking about uh, what could be done in organizations, in the community, in school, in educational settings, what could be done to uh, prevent and what could be done um, uh, in cases of, of situations. There is a very new report, 2020, by Darling Pope, Mooney, King and Applet on child sexual abuse in sports uh, within the Truth Project, which tried to focus on uh, the newest data um, concerning uh, this issue. So there, is, there are a lot of data in this area. Coming to the definitions, I spoke quite a lot till now about um, sentences, meanings, uh, what is safeguarding protecting children and athletes in, and athletes in sport? What is safeguarding? Safeguarding refers to the process of protecting children and adults as well to provide safe and effective care. So um, uh, in society, it's better to speak about prevention and to make a uh, situation safe before something occurs. And this is a good, this is a good approach. Um, and this safeguarding uh, processes and, and standards includes all procedures designed to prevent harm to a child. So child protection is part of a safeguarding process, protecting individual children identified as suffering or likely to suffer significant harm. And this includes the child protection procedures which detail how to respond to concerns about the child. Very often, the situation of child is forgotten, of, of children is forgotten, uh, and it's now a trend um, within um, um, concepts of um, prevention of sexual violence and, and abuse to focus on children's um, rights as well. But before coming to the standards, we should also speak about what is abuse. There are different definitions. Child abuse is any form of physical, emotional, sexual mistreatment, or the lack of care that leads, that leads to injury and harm. So it also includes what am I doing, for example, as a president in my organization, that there is no chance um, that children get uh, treated, for example. So commonly, uh, it commonly occurs within the relationship of trust or responsibility, um, and is an abuse of power or a priest of trust. So it's always in combination, in combination um, or combined with uh, powerful situations, uh, powerful people who use their power um, um, for the abuse or for the um, for violence. So abuse can happen to a child regardless of their age, gender race or disability, just to have this in mind. Um, we spoke about all about the four main types of child abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse and neglect. And um, for situation, for educational situations or, or settings in sport, there is also bullying or poor practice an aspect. And uh, it's also included uh, peer violence. So what are children to other children doing it. This is, is also important, the group dynamics, uh, which is um, getting more and more into the focus of the discussion. Who are the abusers? Um, abusers are usually known to and trusted by the child and their family. So they're persons of trust, normally. They could be adults, male or female. Also, we know that the number of females is quite lower. For example, in sport, we have data about 90% male perpetrators, 10% female, but it's not. Um, there are as well females in it. They could be young people within their peer group. They could be family members. Uh, they could be persons the child encounters in the residential setting or in the community, including sports and uh, leisure activities. 
And uh, what is important for sports organizations uh, that on the one hand, an individual may abuse or neglect a child directly, or it could be uh, maybe responsible for abuse because they fail to prevent another person harming that child. For example, in Austria, it's the responsibility of um, the sport organization to do all the best and to organize uh, the measurements that this is not possible. And if, for example, uh, a sports officer in a sports organization, for example, the president knows about the case and uh, does not react, he's also guilty in a way because he has not um, prevented and he did not work in, in, in solving this problem. So the sports organizations are having um, a responsibility for this issue as well. Uh, maybe you've heard about uh, different grooming processes. So uh, an abuse uh, or violence seldomly comes from one moment to the other. It's um, normally within a, a grooming process uh, with different steps and uh, a person who is um, um, the perpetrator normally tries to maintain control so that he won't be identified immediately but he there are different steps the first is um, um, offenders are looking for victims with which it is easier um, to, um, to work with. Then the second step is that they're gaining trust and getting lots of information of the child, of, um, of the victim. Uh, then they're looking for which needs they have and which need the uh, perpetrator could fill perfectly and help them offering gifts. And then there is a phase of isolating um, the potential uh, victim so that the perpetrator is getting the one and only uh, person in trust. And then the um, person starts to um, begins with the abuse. So it's a step by step process. And whenever there is a point where the victim uh, speaks up or uh, start speaking to other people, then there is a, a possibility to um, to to uh, leave the situation. But normally, the persons of uh, the potential uh, victims are so uh, dependent of their um, of the perpetrator so that they uh, can't get out anymore. And they have, and this is the difficult situation that this grooming process of persons of trust. There are also the family members would say, no way that these people could be not good to their child. Uh, this is the, the very difficult situation um, in this grooming process. When it comes to safeguarding requirements for an organizations, then um, organizations should have in place arrangements reflecting the importance of safeguarding and promoting the welfare of children. And this is um, the issue where organizations have big tasks uh, to organize in a senior board, knowledge, skills, expertise, to take the leadership, uh, to organize safe recruitment selections, contracts, procedures, to have a clear whistleblowing procedure and the culture to encourage staff to raise concerns, to look for clear escalation policies, to look to appropriate staff supervision. The more you speak about this issue or on this issue, the easier it, the more difficult it is for um, people to abuse and, and to set, um, to set um, processes of violence because it's in, within a culture of speaking up, within a culture, within, within a transparent culture, um, the grooming process is not possible. So a culture of listening to and consulting with children and with the athletes in the group is uh, a very important aspect for preventing um, sexual violence. A culture of safety, equality and protection is important. They need arrangements to share information with other organizations. This is a difficult situation 
because of um, the law situation that people um, have also the right not being guilty from the beginning on. Um, they need clear lines of accountability for commissions and there is a designated safeguarding, safeguarding lead supporting to fulfill different responsibilities. I'm coming on to different strategies further on. So uh, from a systemic point of view, um, it's important to uh, implement to implement standards for safeguarding and protecting children in sport and uh, there are number, numerous um, projects and models of good practice how to implement standards for safeguarding and protecting children in sport. I'd like to focus as one e example which I find very good but there are lots of different other ones um, from the NSPCC from United Kingdom with Sports England uh, with partners they uh, published the child protection in sport unit the standards for safeguarding and protecting children in sports and I'd like to focus on these 10 standards uh, these are overarching standards which are intended uh, to be relevant to all sports at all levels and they apply to sporting activity that takes place in an organized setting. Umbrella funding and controlling bodies may choose to use them for a variety of purposes. For example, to raise standards, to assist in decision making or to enforcement proposals and for enforcement proposals. So uh, they can be really, uh, they're very important and they're very often one aspect in good governance in sports to implement uh, these standards. I've read in the literature there are one organization make eight standards or nine standards but at the end these are the typically uh, standards which are important uh, to be implemented to prevent sexual harassment in sports. Uh, the following standards have been developed in order to help safeguard and protect children and young people in sport and these standards are based on current good practice um, they're informed by legislation and guidance. They have evidence from research and the experience of what works uh, were included. And this was uh, implemented within a child protection and spot action plan. For example, in the United Kingdom um, in 2000. There was a task force, a spot task force on policy and they worked out these um, standards. So what is the purpose of these standards? To help create a safe sporting environment for children and young people to protect them from harm, uh, to provide a benchmark. It is very important to have benchmarks to assist those involved in sports to make informed decisions so that everybody who is working in a sports organization knows clearly what um, is to do and what is not allowed and to promote good practice and challenge practice that is harmful to children. So at the end this is not only uh, the standards are not uh, have no benefits only for children and young people the target group but also the parents and the carers they know about what are the principles for those working in sport so they're also protecting the people working in sport because if they fall follow the rules and the standards, they're on the right side and um, also for the organizations themselves because they could say we are a professional organization and professional organizations work in a way where children and athletes have, um, have rights they know about, there are transparent procedures and this is um, an, a good way also for the organizations to show um, that they are um, state, they are working state of the art. To the principles, what are the principles of standards? Um, on the one hand, children and young people have a right to enjoy sport free from all forms of abuse and exploitation. This is a civil right, this is a human right, and this right has to be fulfilled also in sport, not only in, in society. All children and young people have equal rights 
to protection from harm. So not only the one, the abled uh, persons, but also the disabled from different social groups, they have equal rights being protected from harm. Um, all children and young people should be encouraged, encouraged to fulfill their potential and inequalities should be challenged. A very important aspect as multiple uh, societies have unspoken differences within, um, the, within the society, different classes, this should be a target which should be overcome and this should also be, very, should be visible in sport as well. Everybody has a responsibility to support the care and protection of children. Doesn't matter if I am the mother of uh, a child in sport or the coach or the president of the sport club or the sponsor of the sport club. Um, this is an important uh, principle that this responsibility has everybody within the setting, within the setting. And sport organizations have a duty to care children and young people who take part in sports. So they're responsible for the welfare of those people who trust in sport. And so they have to take uh, this responsibility uh, very serious. So number one to the, stand, to the 10 standards is the policy. Uh, I, formula, um, I bring different questions. And uh, if you're working in a sport organization, this could be important questions for you to assess how far your organization is concerning this issue. For example, do you have a safeguarding child protection policy? Does it prioritize the welfare of children? Is the policy clear and easy to understand? Is the policy published effectively so that all um, uh, aspects of the organization could know about? Is there a process for dealing with concerns? And you can always answer yes or no. And if there is a no, you have something to do. What is uh, known also from uh, the research is if there is no policy which is implemented, for example, on the, uh, implemented and visible on the website, the risk of uh, having cases is quite higher than um, in the other case. So having a policy which is a statement, which demonstrates the commitment to safeguard children is a very important one. And it shows that the organization is taking its duty of care seriously. So very important aspect and the starting point is uh, organize, formulating uh, in a participatory way would be the best one, a policy which everybody um, contributes to. Uh, the second standard is uh, having procedures and operating systems for this uh, issue. We start with the question, is it clear what to do if there are concerns about the child? Is there guidance on photography, social media, texting or emailing? Can everybody access the child protection procedures? Is there a designated safeguarding person in the organization who is responsible for who is a person in trust? And are complaints about abusive behavior dealt um, with effectively. So procedures need a clear step-by-step -step guidance, what to do, in which case, in which situation, who, who is responsible in the, in the organization, uh, who is the person in trust where, for example, children can go to and speak up if they have experienced something which is not okay. Is there a person within the, responsible in, within the organization who knows about what to do in different um, situations because systems ensure that have to ensure that procedures are implemented and information is also offered. So for example, if I'm a child in a tennis club and I've seen that the coach is doing something to another child, which is not okay, could I find on, for example, the website and information to whom I go to? Uh, this is, important that the organization has to work on this procedure, on this operating system um, from the organization. The third standard is, is prevention. These are measures uh, to help minimize the risks of children and young people. 
being abused in those in a position of of those in by those of an uh, in a position of trust and to prevent abuse by putting safeguards in place and you can ask are there procedures for recruiting people working with children for example in austria we are working very hard on um, together with uh, sports organizations that they get from their um, people they want to recruit uh, a certificate of the police that they have um, um, done things which are not allowed um, and so on. Are there clear ways to raise concerns about unacceptable behavior um, by staff and volunteers? Is there a safeguarding plan, for example, for trips and transporting children? It is known from um, literature and studies that especially situations of bringing children home from a competition, for example. Having situations, being alone with a child, a coach alone with a child, are moments um, with higher risks. And um, this has to be um, spoken with in the club, how we do, how this works, uh, what should the parents know about uh, in typical situations in sports like trips and, and transporting. And do you ensure that children are always supervised when you provide activities? Who is supervising, uh, who is doing it, who are accompanying persons, for example, and what are the rules and regulations in situations like this? Uh, code standard number four is codes of practice and behavior. Uh, in Austria, for example, we uh, we supposed in our action plan that each uh, coach should sign a code of conduct, a code of ethics, uh, with clear benchmarks what is acceptable or not. Uh, should sign it before they start working. And what we've known also from different studies is, if there is a clear policy, if um, there are codes of conduct, codes of practice, codes of behaviors which um, coaches have to sign and which officials have to sign, then the likelihood of um, of cases is quite lower than in the other the other way around. So, do you have codes of ethics? Ethics very important. Is guidance available on expected behavior standards of behavior? So, how should we behave as children? Um, what about situations where you're alone with um, children and athletes? Is there a guidance on expected behavior of children towards other children? It, this concerns the behavior, for example, group um, peer uh, violence, for example. Are there processes for dealing with unacceptable behavior so that everybody knows if you behave in another way or in this and that way, um, you could be excluded for the from the sports organizations, for example. And do senior management ensure children um, are listened to and respected? So lots of questions where you can think about what could uh, be done in sports organizations. Standard number five is equity, a very important issue um, and measures which ensure the needs of all children, young people, and to set step steps to combat discriminations. So if we accept, for example, that we um, work differently with different groups, different uh, children from different social classes, from different eth ethnicities, uh, with different abilities. If there is an acceptance of these discriminations, then violence, sexual violence, abuse has a much higher chance um, uh, being visible. So for example, question, is your safeguarding policy clear that all children have equal rights to protection, very important aspect. As well as our staff and volunteers supported to recognize and to respond to additional vulnerability of some children. Are your codes of conduct clear that discriminatory offensive and violent behavior is unacceptable? And are complaint 
uh, procedures fair? Are they open to challenge through an appeals process? So equity, equality, also gender equality um, is an issue which should be um, focused um, very seriously in sports and also in the society as a whole um, because differences, inequality, discriminations opens the door for abuse and violence as well. Communication is always important in the standards and procedures concerning communication. There should be, there, uh, it's, it's clear that it's, standards are only effective if people are aware of them. If people have some ownership of them, they have accepted, they have developed them, um, they have the opportunity to express their views on how they are working. So it makes sense that if you're um, starting uh, developing uh, procedures, policies, it makes sense to include as many persons as possible from an organization because then they have worked on it, they have developed it and then it's easier to uh, implement and it's easier to fulfill all these uh, standards. And therefore it's important uh, that you focus on communication within the organization and questions you could ask for the assessment is is the organization openly committed to safeguarding? Are young people aware of their right to be safe from abuse? Are there posters uh, where it's clear which rights children have? Do young people and parents know where to go for help with concerns about child abuse and safeguarding? Is there an information provided clear and easy for everyone to understand, not under the desk everywhere in, in, um, in the office of the president, but also visible for all the members of the sports organizations and the athletes and children as well. And does everyone know who to contact if they have concerns? So very much could be done in terms of prevention if there is a good, clear and transparent communication within an organization. It's clear that this means you need time but it's worth um, to use this time. And this brings me to the point of education and training. Uh, it's important if organizations uh, who are providing sporting activities for children and knowing that they have the responsibility for them in the training, in the development of opportunities, then it's important to train and educate them and the question for the assessment is, is there an induction process for staff and volunteers who are in significant contact with children? Do they know about their duties they have? Uh, do they know um, the coaches, the staff, the volunteers, which rights the children have? So the question is also, are all staff and volunteers provided with relevant safeguarding training? Do they get information on it? Um, are children provided with information? what we've spoken before, and this support available to individuals affected by safeguarding concerns. In Austria, for example, um, at the moment we are implementing in each of our 65 federal sports associations a person who is responsible for safeguarding. Um, they are uh, educated, they are trained, and then we try to um, implement um, these information is also bottom down, uh, top down to uh, the club level. And uh, the main aim or goal would be that in each club, in each uh, association, and in each sports um, organization, uh, there is a person um, who, is uh, his, who is responsible for uh, safeguarding. Um, in the organization. So standard number eight is the, is the access to advice and support. Do children have information about where to get help and support? Do those uh, with designated safeguarding roles have access to specialist advising information? So do they know where is a victim organization, for example? Because it's not the task of a sports official to um, 
accompany the whole process from getting um, having heard of a case till solving the problem till the end. In m many cases, you need external support. These external support are specialists in child protection, in how to work and deal with uh, persons who experienced, um, for example, sexual violence. And therefore, you need specialists and you need to know where are the specialists, which specialist um, should uh, is able to work with children, which specialist, for example, in Austria, we have um, an association working with males um, as offenders, but also as, as victims. And uh, these uh, safeguarding persons should know about and have this information. And is support available to individuals involved in an investigation or complaint? Who are the responsible supporters in the different stages um, of if a person is um, affected? So number nine, implementation and monitoring. If we have there are if there are policies, they have to be implemented across and in all parts of the organizations and to be checked. To be honest, this is a very difficult process. For example, in Austria, we have an action plan, we have the policies. Uh, we have now at the moment all the 65 spots federations, all the umbrella sports organizations who have started uh, in implementing all these uh, measures. But the problem is uh, how to bring all this information to the specific, to uh, each sport club on the grassroots level. And therefore you need different strategies. And uh, questions for this uh, standard are uh, what steps will be taken to safeguard children? The question is, are there resources and are there available to help to implement these? In Austria, for example, we uh, asked the sports minister who uh, supported our policy very much and the action plan, but uh, he has also to um, uh, support with financial aspects because if you want to implement all these standards, this also costs uh, some money. Um, the question is also, are there regular reviews to be, uh, be put in place? Question if young people and parents are involved and the safeguarding concerns recorded or monitored. And if you want to monitor it, you need different strategies. You need maybe questionnaires. You need uh, persons who do this um, and uh, um, to bring uh, these standard into practice. Last standard is influencing an important issue as well, as uh, also all these actions taken by an organization to influence, encourage, and promote the adoption and implementation of measures to safeguard children by partner organizations. For example, if there is a sponsor, you have to old, you normally should also um, force the sponsors, the surrounding environment to support these safeguarding uh, issues. With the question, is the organization's stance and safeguarding made clear to all partners? Does partnership funding and commissioning criteria include a requirement to address safeguarding? So for example, just can get a sponsor if you fulfill these regulations as well. Does the organization actively promote safeguarding within all partnership working and seek to establish minimum safeguarding standards? And uh, does the organization provide or signpost safeguarding support and resources to partner organizations? So very important, not only to cook in the own kitchen, but on, all, also to look around to the partners so that um, the information on safeguarding is known by everybody and by each um, aspect. So you can ask also if this ten, this, these 10 standards um, are in place, are proposed or not in place, so that you can get a good overview of what to do and what about the next steps. Uh, finally, I like to focus on different models of good practice and projects. 
Um, I also already focused on uh, the IOC. They implemented a toolkit for the international federations and the national Olympic committees on the issue of safeguarding athletes from harassment and abuse in sports. Uh, in the end of the presentation, I have an, a number, I have several links where you can find all this and you can also find the different steps in it. You can find references and liter literature in it. So the IOC took the, uh, took the duty seriously as well and they started working on um, the standards, implementing the standards and forcing these standards also from its partner organizations and federations. Um, at the moment in Europe, uh, there is a project running by EPAS. This is uh, uh, an organization from the Council of Europe um, with the focus on enlarged partial agreement on sport. And they started because they know there is lots of uh, information about child safeguarding already done, but the organizations in the member states have not implemented it. And with this project, which uh, started this year, they focused on um, different European countries to implement uh, child safeguarding in sports within their structures, within their organizations. Um, and they want to um, accompany this project in looking for what are the barriers in, in the implementing process, what are the supporting factors when implementing, um, and um, they try to work with the stakeholders of each country, in, the stakeholders in sports uh, in each country to get, it, to get this um, um, task implemented. But not only the international organizations, uh, only, but also federal, international federal organizations, for example, FIFA developed the toolkit. FIFA is very much known worldwide, a sport which is very common uh, in the world. And um, if they do uh, child safeguarding for the member associations, then uh, it's also kind of um, it's important for also for other uh, sports as well and in their um, toolkit they have five principles five steps so if there are ten or five or six uh, the content is quite the same step one how are children involved in our game and what safeguards uh, already exist step two is set out and define your safeguarding policy step three develop procedures and guidelines to implement the policy, step four, communication, education, and step five, how will you monitor, evaluate, and review your policies, procedures, and guidelines? So you uh, see within these five steps, it's similar to the DEN um, uh, standards uh, we spoke before. And FIFA is very interested uh, that um, safeguarding procedures are implemented worldwide as it got known from uh, several um, studies from UK that there is a high number of male uh, soccer players or football players who suffered from sexual violence and abuse and maybe you've heard about two years ago there was um, a high number of persons and, and former soccer players from the 1950s, 60s, 70s who spoke up um, 20, 30 years after um, this case occurs because um, they tried to forget um, their experiences um, and now they're old enough, how they told that now it's possible for them to speak. And as you can see, it sometimes takes decades uh, that the person, persons are then possible and able to speak about. So it's a very difficult, difficult process to speak up because it's an issue of shame. Um, the grooming process uh, leads or the, brings the people to think about their, um, it's, it's their own fault that um, this case occurred. 
and with this feeling of shame lots of people uh, don't speak about don't speak about don't look for help because they feel guilty themselves and and it needs sometimes decades um, and a psychotherapist process as well to speak about it and being able to talk about it this was also uh, an issue of the european project voice um, voices for truth and dignity combating sexual violence in european sports through the voices of those affected and within this project uh, we tried to um, hear the voices of those being affected we did several interviews with people who suffered from sexual violence and we uh, identified typical stories, which we used then to produce educational films and good practice guides. Um, if you Google voice, voice of the truth and dignity, you have approach to these videos and you can learn much, quite a lot of these stories. The persons tell you what they suffered and their um, uh, suggestions, what uh, sports organizations should change should do that cases the risk of cases uh, would be minimalized um, when i uh, was looking for preparing this presentation i was also looking to examples in india and i found interestingly a big uh, report in us in an austrian journal in 2000 one year ago on uh, an example in India that karate and self-defense courses for girls were organized uh, being um, against sexual violence and um, a young woman who was um, a master in karate, Seda Falak was her name and she was in, I hope I pronounce it correctly, Telangana, she was a star and she was, uh, took part in world champions and she was nationally and internationally very um, successful and she uh, organized these courses um, within schools uh, within clubs in the community uh, in Hyderabad what I've read about she's also not only working with children and girls but also with teachers uh, to uh, empower them that they are strong they have possibilities uh, to uh, uh, defend sexual violence, knowing that it's not an easy task, but having some skills um, to work uh, on this issue. Another example, what I found in, in literature is that there was a Laureus Sports for a Good Award, the Yuga School, and it's a project in Jharkhand to support girls through sports and to support them as athletes, as coaches, uh, supporting them with education because there is a big difference within the society and within uh, projects um, like this. It's possible through supporting people, through empowering um, the people, the young people, the girls, the boys as well, um, to having um, the power to say no it's not an easy task uh, it's clear that uh, saying no uh, needs the support of the organization uh, and at the end it's the organization who is responsible to make everything possible uh, that this environment is a safe environment and with this sentence i'd like to close i've brought a list of resources on safeguarding children in sports. Maybe Usha can share these resources with, with, the, with the audience and the group. Yeah. And uh, with this, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I hope my translation system did it right. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rosa. It was a wonderful session, very informative session. But I think I could take one, a few questions also. Could we, could we, uh, could you sh stop sharing, please? Yeah. Moment. I still have it. Could you just stop sharing? Yeah, 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 yeah.
Is it gone? Yeah. Before we start, before we get into the question, I'd like to mention that we have a distinguished guest with us, none other than Rishirat Singh, IPS. Rishirat Singh sir was appointed to the IPS in 1985 and is a part of the Kerala cadre. He started his career as an ASP in Kerala and served as DCP in Kochi and Commissioner of Police in Trivandrum. He was appointed SP and later DIT in the Central Bureau of Investigation. He was involved in the investigation of cases such as Graham Stain's murder, Purilia Arms Drops, and Mumbai Serial Blast. In 2009, he joined the National Investigation Agency as a founding member. At NIA, he headed the Terror Financing and Fake Currency Specialized Cell. Prior to his appointment as DGP of Kerala, he served as Director, Kerala Fire and Rescue Services. He was part of the team that traveled to United States to question David Hardley in 2010. He took charge as Joint Director CBI's ACB Central Zone Bhopal in January 2013. He was posted to Trivandrum as Transport Commissioner in June. Under his administration, accident rates declined considerably. He later became Excise Commissioner of Kerala. So as right now the uh, DGP of the prisons in Kerala. At NIS, Sir was awarded the President's Medal for Distinguished Service in 2009. On behalf of the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, Government of India, Hello India, and Lakshibai National College of Physical Education, a warm welcome to you, Rishirat sir. So, I would be. Am I audible, madam? Yes, sir. Okay. I would be speaking in general terms about uh, what is wrong what is wrong in sports in india in general and at the world level in particular you see after going to nearly 700 schools and colleges while i was uh, size commissioner I interacted a lot with the teachers and students also. We all know that sports is not very important in India. In fact, it, uh, I'm sorry to say that sports is not even, there is no period of sports in most of Indian schools. Mm -hmm. uh, you ask any child and they say that uh, like, you know, there are eight periods or seven periods in a school. Sports period is not there anywhere. As uh, I also found very interestingly, there is no period for library visit also. So they are all concentrating on their hard subjects like history, civic, geography, mathematics or so. So anyway, the association with the sports in India is very, very less. Kerala the state where we are sitting now, Kerala is an exception because Kerala, the sports has been, uh, the schools and colleges have been very active in the sports from last 30, 40 years. Now, the problem is in the sports, which I find now, nowadays is the drug abuse. That is the, that is so rampant that it is very difficult to even give to give a thought how are we going to control it so first of all why children or even students in the colleges they do take drug we should have a reason for that what reason i found out on my own was stress level among children like the parents are always after their life that they should be doing very well in the in the academics. So those who are in the academics, the, the parents and the teachers, they want them to excel all the time to get A plus grade, you know, every time. Same is the case with the sports. Those who are not in, those who are good in the sports. So now the parents want that merely playing for a school is not sufficient. You should get medal. 
Now that medal is of no use for a child. Suppose he gets the medal in the sixth standard or seventh standard anywhere, but then the level of competition has gone in the head in the heads of parents so much that nobody wants his or her child coming at second level, at second place or even third place. This is very strange. This kind of thing. Now. he will not be getting any job or any advertisement you know if he comes first or second or third or so at school level maximum he comes first he will be allowed to uh, to represent the school that is okay but that doesn't mean that we should get up to the life of the child to to get him at one uh, to get him at the first place every time that is what it is happening so what do the children do so they also react so they from the very beginning they start taking drugs i have seen schools and colleges where the school level tournaments were over let us say and if someone visited up in the evening in the late evening so one could see thousands of wheels thousands of injections used injections wrappers of some medicines being taken during the competition thereby meaning that there are chances that the children are competing at school level sports competitions while taking drugs or you know the with the help of the drugs because child wants to child uh, the child wants to come at the first place that is the level of stress level on them that is a big problem so my advice here for the parents and the teachers is that let the child participate he comes first due to his ability or her ability it is okay but they need not pressurize him or her so hard that the child is left with no option but to take the drugs help this is a big problem and we have to think about it secondly we come to the coaches now coaches as madam was speaking from austria the there is a madam was speaking exhaustively how they are tackling with the the sexual abuse about the the so sexual abuse is also quite rampant in india also the other day we got the the other day we read in the newspaper then some of the coaches some of the male coaches were the the action was taken against them as uh, the girls in wrestling or in some other sports they spoke that they were being constantly harassed sexually harassed by their coaches the so cases are being taken it is not only limited to india it is all over the world we have seen these cases in america we have seen these cases in europe we have seen uh, i mean in tennis field i mean a lot of things are coming so coaches has to be coaches uh, we have to have a strict uh, we have to have a strict control on the, the behavior of the coaches there is there is no doubt about it madam we uh, rosa madam i would like to tell you that uh, in india this problem is slightly not it is not that serious as we find in uh, outside india that is in europe or in america because here it seems that the parents are traveling with the sports girl all the time you read the biographies of the sports players i i invariably read the biographies of all the sports people and i i the other day i read the sports biography of sania mirza now sania mirza's father has traveled with her in the last 25 years wherever she has gone so if somebody's parent is traveling whether it is mother or father so this sexual uh, this sexual abuse prospect uh, this probability is are very very less it is not that rampant so so this coaches this coaches this as far as the sexual abuse is concerned we have to have a strict control over the coaches number one then the coach is also responsible for giving you know this uh, advice of drugs to these people to their sports people 
you read the biography of lance armstrong two biographies he has written every second counts and second is it is not about the cycle it, it is not about bicycle or something it is you read his biography and now of course all his medals have been taken away and now he is about to be prosecuted in in america but he will say in those biographies he later also now he is telling that it is his coach who will tell him when to take the drug at which time to take the drug so much so that coach used to take him to germany from all the way from america to germany for a particular doctor this uh, uh, particular doctor who was uh, who was an expert on of giving uh, you know drugs there is a time for that they he has uh, he had mentioned now he is mentioning how the how the drug was being given to him so much so that even while participating in the tour de france mm -hmm. while participating there was an arrangement where the cycle will be stopped then the cycle and the cyclist will be taken into the van and the drug was being given to them so this coach then the other day we read about the santa monica club of america santa monica club salazar the club i think the name of the uh, the name of uh, the uh, coach is salazar salazar was giving drugs to uh, these uh, uh, these athletics uh, these athletes who were who were representing america so many americans have been caught the other day two days before coleman the 100 meter 100 meter winner of the last world championship has been now banned for three years so the the possibility of drug abusing the knowledge the, the method it is the coach which knows not the not the uh, the player as such the athlete as such so these coaches have to be also they we have to have the wada the wada this world athletic uh, the organization or other organizations they have to control these coaches rather than the sports people it is high time to control the behavior of the coaches because they are free uh, it seems you remember in 1988 ben johnson when he was caught by taking drug it was his coach who was giving him uh, i mean who was uh, the coach should be morally he should be held he should be held responsible player should also player should be held responsible he should be banned it is all right but what about the coach i don't see any effort being taken to to ban the coach or to send him to the jail or so i have yet to see it i don't know what happened to salazar i mean i didn't see that any case is registered in america against him or so so this is also coach now there has time has come then the coach should also be put under proper usage i mean they should also be followed by this world of anti doping uh, agencies or so third is the severity of the sports you see this lance armstrong writes in his book that for example take the, the you have made the sports so severe you have made the sports so i mean uh, it is now beyond the human limitations take for example tour de france if you read the newspapers in the july or august when the tour de france uh, is there experts will say it is inhuman you are asking a cyclist to cycle for 21 days continuously maybe only sleeping hours or some sleeping hours are there otherwise you are cycling for nearly 16 hours 17 hours in all sorts of uh, in all sorts of uh, uh, the grounds it is plateau is there alps is there when it is raining when there are very steep uh, climbing is there nearly 3000 kilometers just imagine in 21 days you are expecting a cyclist to cycle for 3000 kilometers so as the cyclists say that unless we take drugs we cannot even complete this race if that is the level so why are we doing it i mean now the time has come if you want to stop the use of drugs from sports 
you have to think about the level of the severity in the sports you cannot ask a person a person a layman like you and me without taking any drug and completing two day fans in 21 days and cycling for 3000 kilometers i mean are we joking or what 3000 kilometer is from trivandrum to delhi that is and you all the time cycling in all unfavorable conditions that is the case with the, the gold medal you expectations are so high every country wants to win a every country wants to win a gold medal i mean the country's the country's prestige is put at stake the whether if you win the you win the gold medal only then uh, then the crores of rupees the billions and millions of dollars are given to them if you win and if you come at the fourth place you don't get anything this kind of this kind of distinction will not work so nobody will like to come at fourth place everybody will like to come at least the third place second place or first place so for that they will do anything your testing everything is sometime it is before some it is random you know sometime it is later so gold medal you have already won the gold medal even if you are tested positive let us say after one year or so by the time you have got a job i mean the damage is done but you uh, the sports have taken care of you so the severity the expectation has to come down for example take the example of austria take the example of france take example of italy i always see i i am a sports follower i myself was a sports player i always see in the the olympic records you see from the last 100 years you will see italy france austria netherland switzerland hardly winning a medal maybe one or two but the development of the sports is so good in their countries that they are always in the top 10 whatever medals they will get they will be in the top 10 or top 15 that's enough so sport development is also there and these countries are not putting their sportsmen under undue uh, duress that no 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 you go there and you win that's a good system i support the system level i support the good spirited sports system in these country in these most of the western country uh, the western european countries rather than asian countries or america or russia or china or so where the winning is so important no wonder that the sport this this uh, drug abuse cases are more coming from these countries where the expectations are very high this is all i wanted to say madam thank you very much for giving me an opportunity this thank is what i saw this is what i saw in the schools and colleges stress level is very high not from the children a child will not like to put his health at peril and then to win a medal no but he or she is being compelled by parents by teachers by their parent teacher association and when you are representing the country then the expectations of the whole country is so high then they are left with no other option but to go for the dubious uh, efforts thank you very much thank you sir thank you so much sir this indeed uh... you brought in truth because it's done wonders whenever you, whichever position you are you have brought in people to the right kind of a task thank you so much sir may i now uh, ask sort of questions to rosa please yeah thank you sir i should answer yeah i'll i'll, tell, I'll ask the questions yeah. to you mm -hmm. um so I absolutely, i do absolutely agree that uh, high expectations from the system from the parents from society being the best is the reason uh, why sometimes abuse violence to have to take drugs um will be the door opened for it because lots of expectations around but on the other hand if you look we're looking to safeguarding the children uh, there are united nations charters that whatever is done in different areas of education sports should uh, support the development of children uh, should support their personalis that they are getting good personalities from a holistic point of development and 
also the sport should take this uh, task seriously and think about what are uh, the standards, how could we deal about, how, how could we work in the area of being the best, is this the only thing which is important? I have to, have to agree. Um, and being forced to take drugs is one form of violence. And uh, in terms of children, this is an absolutely no-go. And you should think about which kind of sport do we want to develop, uh, which are the principles, what are the standards. And maybe we have to think about competitions in children and what are the tasks behind. So we have to discuss about and sports organizations should think about what could be the consequences, what could be maybe some aspects of risk in this way, because all children want to be the best, of course, but you have to think about with educational pedagogical approaches, what are we doing with the second, the third, the last one in the competition? Adults, we could say it's their responsibility to work with it, but in terms of children, we need to have clear standards what is, what is supporting their development in a positive way. And if it does not uh, help them to develop in a good way, we have to think about the measures. Okay. Uh, how do we create, this a question that is in terms of touch, good touch or bad touch, because in sports we always have contact. Mm -hmm. Touch cases, how would you, how as a coach, because many a time the coach hesitates. Mm -hmm. So what would be your suggestion be like, what could be done in this case? Because in coaching uh, you have body contacts. Um, safeguarding does not mean that touches, uh, touching people is bad. This is not the case. Uh, being in touch with other people, being touched uh, is a kind of trust. And if you're working with, as a coach with children, then I have to make clear in the beginning of the course with informing the parents which kind of touches are okay and uh, how is it possible for children or athletes to say this is not okay. And this could be differently between you and me. And for me, some touches are okay and for others are not. Uh, and in a culture where you're allowed, where you're able to say, I don't like this, then it's a good way. So you have to negotiate not only once in a year, but in different situations, what is okay and what is not okay. And if it, there is a culture of, of um, speaking up uh, about the own uh, experiences, expressions, then it's worse. So you have to speak with your athletes and you have to make this transparent. Then it's no problem at all. If you don't speak about and um, the parents don't know what's going on, then it's more difficult and it's easier for um, offenders as well. In a sporting situation, success matters. You see in the case of Dr. Nassar for the U.S. Uh, gymnastic team. Because once you get into the Olympic podium, then the, uh, it's a success. But how to, mo how to get them speaking out? Um, speaking up is, is a very difficult thing. Uh, if there is a culture of respect, then it's a bit easier. If uh, it's not that easy because you're all, the, all as we've heard in the comment before, um, it's also because you have different expectations. If you want to be part of a team, then I maybe won't say that much. So it depends on if there is units uh, from the system different. Um, um, prerequisites, for example, persons of trust where you can go to and, dis and speak if, there, if you have some problems, if there is a system which makes clear that speaking up does not mean only criticizing, it means making things transparent where we discuss about it. Um, 
if you don't have a policy where this is clear that um, uh, discussing is welcome, makes a difference. And discussing does not mean only criticizing, it means bringing things forward, uh, changing things which could be better or something like this. So it, on the one hand, it's the system, and on the other hand, it's a very open, transparent culture of respect where different meanings have a place. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, Dali, Kuka, for your remarks, please. Uh, Rosa, thank you so much for bringing this topic to light. Uh, this is uh, an extremely sensitive topic to uh, show light on, uh, but um, uh, I think that these kinds of, of discussions, and I was looking at the questions that people are asking, um, it, it might be uh, a, a good idea if you can access those questions to maybe see if you can take a little time to answer the people. Um, some of them are quite specific and you probably have a good uh, short explanation or a short uh, idea uh, to make it work. Uh, I believe that the, the most difficult part is that you will have people in positions of authority who absolutely believe that what they're doing is okay. And uh, because it's a power position, uh, there are many uh, places still in uh, one continent specifically that I know of uh, where um, the only way that young, young girls can get to play on the team is to have sex with their male coach. Those kinds of things, uh, the way I look at that, is really not a choice for the athlete. And so perhaps one of the focuses needs to be athlete-centered kinds of ways of looking at things in addition to perhaps uh, all of the don't do this and don't do that. Um, but sometimes people just need um, an, uh, one easy solution example. I'm not sure it's written in any book, and it may be, but I haven't read it, uh, where when you have a, a meeting with anyone by yourself, keep the door open or keep the window open so that people can see that everything in that office is okay. Very simple solution, but people don't, don't share those simple solutions. Uh, I didn't wanna go on too, too badly here, but um, uh, Rosa, I really applaud what you're doing. Uh, and uh, if uh, any of us can continue to support what you're doing, we would be delighted to do that. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. It was wonderful because there are questions and we'll definitely see that we'll mail the questions to us if we don't have time now. May I now ask Rosa? Rosa, where are you? Hello, you're Hi, referring to Rosa, Rosa D'Amico, right? <laughs> well, thank you very much, and Rosa. I mean, the topic you brought out is a, uh, it's a sensitive topic because we all approach it from different perspectives. Now, but you also indicated and combined with what uh, Mr. Rishi, Rish ha, have said, it's, it's there are pressures in society. So to what extent we all contribute to what's going on? So this is a question just to leave it out because uh, I think all those pressure also brings athletes in, I mean, particularly their elite level, to go to the extreme, no matter what, okay? And I said, sort of mistreatment. I also want to refer, I really like all the steps and uh, recommendation for rules and standards. So I think all organizations, I mean, should have at least sort of these rules because you can't just approve an organization without a code of ethics without having there the rules of how to protect 
all stakeholders. Of course, we insist on children, but it's all stakeholders. Because from the questions I was also observing, that coaches might feel harassed by parents and vice versa. I mean, there are, there are all sorts of stories that goes around all the stakeholders in, uh, in the organizations. So then, I mean, we have in a way to make clear, I mean, there are some rules that we in nation, nationally establish to organization, for example, to register. So one criteria should be, you should have this. I mean, it should be compulsory to have safeguarding uh, rules for kids and to make it visible. There is no question, I mean, it is proven that one of the reasons that we have less participation of women in sport is because there's mistreatment. I mean, this has been uh, worldwide proven. So maybe we organizations who hasn't been too strong at a national level in order to push that because that is telling something that it's a message in there so why do we have maybe one of the reasons is because people don't feel safe to participate okay so and even though for example you indicated the international organizations which is i mean really good and there are those guidance my my belief i have always said in certain things international organizations are too soft too soft they just the, give guidance. It's like when in the year 2000, the IOC said, we suggest to have more women. We suggest, but that's it. So you see here, I mean, we give guidance, but in the same way they push International Federation for other decisions, this should be pushed. And in that way, I think we all will feel safer in sport. Because if they leave sport, I mean, they have other areas where to go. We want to attract more people to practice. So it means that we should look for ways, and I still believe there are the ways that are there are not enough. Because no matter what, we are observing mistreatment in all cultures, in all countries. So there it's an, an advice in there. There is a red light there telling us that something is not good. Okay, thank you so much for bringing this topic, Rosa. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, Maria, Maria, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Maria. Thank you, Rosa. It's nice to meet each other this way. A bit louder, please. Uh, I can, okay, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, come into the university at the moment. I can't hear you. It's too we can't loud. Hear you. Yeah, Maria. We can't hear you, Maria. In the meantime, can maybe, you? Maybe one Let's comment uh, on Rosa's. Uh, that's right, we should put it more is. pressure. We should put more pressure on it. For example, in Austria, all coaches who are want to participate uh, as coaches in the Olympic Games or Youth Olympic Games have to sign a contract that have to sign the Code of Ethics, otherwise they're not allowed to join. And at the moment we are working to implement a safeguard safeguarding officers and those organizations who don't have a policy, who don't have a safeguarding officer, won't get financially supported by the ministry. We want to implement this. We are on a good way. This was the red uh, flag Rosa mentioned before. It needs sometimes a bit of more pressure to bring good governance into practice. Yeah. Now, Marie, is done. Uh, Beatrice, can you, can you, for your remarks, please? Beatrice? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rosa, for bringing this wonderful but very sensible problem, issue in, in sport in the world. You know, it, when you hear all of this, you know about this, but when you hear, you say, we need to do something else. And we need to help more and more. 
And I can see the questions here. Everybody's asking, how can you do this? How can I, I, can I, I avoid this? You know, is it possible to do something else? You know, it's always the same question. And I can see that in our days, there are laws, as you said, more laws. There are more international organizations helping. The media is helping a lot. People have more courage to speak. And they have more support. And uh, years ago, you know, nobody would say. And uh, it's something that uh, you can see in Brazil, because you have all these marchers, men, and then they are so uh, ashamed to, mm. to tell. You know, it's a very huge barrier that a man feels ashamed of reporting sex, sexual abuse. And then, and then, especially in the low social class, in the football, football is more common. We, can, we heard that we had the figure of a godfather that pay for the, a salary for, for the, those young athletes. But uh, nobody knew what happened. It was a very, it's a figure that was not very well recognized. And I would, I would like to ask you, Rosa, if you can see some this uh, social class difference, if there is more on low social class or middle class, or you can see in all class, social class. Uh, did I understood you right this, that the question was if there are differences in being uh, abused between different social classes? Yes. Yeah. Um, the study uh, studies say no. There is no difference between different social classes in the risk of being affected, but uh, persons who are young people and also children who are more under pressure and more dependent have um, more problems to say no. And one thing in, in literature and in, in working is uh, to empower persons and young people to know about their rights. There was one question, how we educate children about physical abuse. Uh, one approach would be not to tell what abuse is, but to tell what is good for them and what is not good for them. There is the stop line, there is the yellow line, and there is the red line. Uh, and this is an aspect which could children be taught very early from the kindergarten on. This is my body, and I like being touched in that way, and I don't like being touched in another way. This is the very important thing which we could teach uh, children very, very early. And persons who are empowered, children who are empowered, who are sure of what they are, uh, are at lower risk, nevertheless, which social class it is. But to learn to say no, to know where the boundaries are, uh, to know what I want, and being allowed to say this in a, in a way, this is the, a very preventive aspect. And what we've heard, uh, abuse and violence is in different settings, not only in sport, but uh, only in different classes, there is, at the end, the, the research, um, um, research doesn't say that it's one group more vulnerable than another, at the end. No? Yeah, okay, thank you. But if there is a social group very suppressed and discriminated, then discrimination and being suppressed is uh, an option where Abuse, violence is easier. Yeah. Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you, Rosa. Dr. Kishore, sir, for your, for your remarks. Uh, good evening to everyone. Respected Director General of Police Presents, Rishra Singh, sir, other distinguished panelists. It was a very well presented session, one of the most burning. And uh, most of the live issue, it is being confronted not only in the field of sports, but also in various uh, other fields, or various other sectors, various segments of life. Uh, I think uh, Madam Rosa has very rightly pointed out its scenario worldwide, and also with special reference to India, wherein 
and uh, shown about the alarming situation and when the statistics are shown a very high rate of uh, abuse uh, in, in india so what we could say that you know uh, as a remedial measures of course all the preventive measures statutory and other so social responsibility one has to undertake is definitely need to be highlighted need to be uh, taken on fast track and uh, i think rishraj singh sir and all uh, you know from the police side they have been doing a very very active role sir has gone to more than around the thousand schools and uh, has uh, uh, spoken to all the children about how strong they should be this is one way he is one of the most uh, eminent versatile police officers of the country and he is being recognized regarded and uh, respected by the entire india and especially the children take and carries his every word and he take him as a hero so he has taken a crusade in this not only on this abuse but also many of the social thing and more than 1000 schools he make it to visit every school and speak to the children to safeguard them and as far as that is one of the way which we can that we need to uh, immune the children we need to uh, empower the children that they need to themselves safeguard too it is the efforts of course statutory and what can be done by parents society uh, are there but more than that the child himself herself or himself they should themselves feel that they should also uh, do you know be very strong they should feel strong and they should themselves become active against this uh, uh, in fact our the name of our institution is uh, itself is on, uh, rani lakshmi bai named after rani lakshmi bai of jansi you can see the various uh, picture right be, be behind uh, usha mad can see that that's a barrier who fought for india's freedom and uh, with a with a kid on uh, her lap and, and fought with the mighty britishers and and sacrificed herself but she never uh, allowed her to be conquered or taken into prison likewise india's indian history if you trace you can find that there are many mighty warriors from beham hasrat mahal uma devi rani avanti bhai rani rani neel velu naichar rani chennamma so these were these were all very relentless mighty warriors in indian history they fought and that is what the tradition of india but somehow the next generation uh, uh, is were not able to invite rather we need to inculcate into them there is a barrier lying in, in, in inside you in india that is you know there that there is a feeling of uh, uh, if you take the indian goddess there is different phases for that girl there is a phase for affection there is a phase for love there is a phase of uh, uh, anger also where there is a aggression also where in in that phase you know it comes that that is uh, that phase is uh, being uh, if you are if in case of any injustice that phase uh, is being the one which is depicted so we need to have that aggressive phase also to be uh, made by to be shown by the ladies and that even in the uh, recent uh, generation uh, kerala has got a traditional martial art known as kalari pait we were having very very uh, eminent warriors from the women lady warriors also too there is a story of one lady warrior known as unni archa uh, who uh, was uh, you know he was uh, even a better fighter than even the uh, uh, the other warriors the men warriors gender wise she was and it is being thought that she used to teach the if anybody come to teach her she has even uh, to, to handle them uh, ma- ma- very very tackle them and handle them and they were not able to suppress her and once she, she was taking a bath in a, in a river river like or and somebody want try to tease her she even overpowered them and handled them with uh, you know that uh, uh, she was having only a uh, uh, that clothes linen which which she was washing even with that she could, that is the story and there is a movie also known as vadakan viragatha where we can see that how martial arts uh, that uh, is performed by ladies in fact uh, we also have taken a few ventures in this direction we have also a, a few trainings uh, made uh, trainings made uh, also sessions made for the girls i will just show you one of the sessions which we had held in the recent past born in ambedkar school a school for the children uh, from the uh, 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 in the residential school for, meant for the uh, children from the backward uh, you can kindly see this <laughs>
so this is a type of option activities so uh, this type of martial arts the traditional martial arts or any sort of such activities which will give them the courage and empower them and and makes them is better you know prevention is better than cure so once the child herself feels strong and she takes she can she becomes bold it is very difficult uh, you know if she can she will derive the courage to withstand this uh, type type of uh, people and try to fight and, and try to save that i think we should also take this into because man bossa is they is leading a crusade in this direction maybe she can and can advocate a bit into how we can empower them and make the children to realize their uh, their own capacity to fight and, and tackle these menaces by themselves so this will be a great uh, play a role i once again place on record our sincere appreciation for uh, all the eminent panelists who have taken out their valuable time who has in different time uh, you know lines who have come over here and especially Rishraj Singh sir, who is too busy, he was he is one of the persons here heading the police force in the state. So he having spared this much of time is something you know. He shows his interest towards this field and this, uh, especially on sports and this subject. I place on record our sincere appreciation to you sir, and also Madam for the excellent presentation. I have we have also requested all the administrators of SAI to join in this presentation. They were also present, I presume. So the entire administrators of SAI managing the various centers all over the country are also present in this amongst the participants. They will also have been greatly benefited out of it. Thank you very much, John. And thank, thank you all panelists. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kishor, sir. Thank you so much. At the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Rosa. Rosa, it was a wonderful session. And I'm sure uh, we will be looking forward to a workshop. That's the thing I think the, the, the next stage would be where, where I think a part workshop we could think of to introduce something of safeguarding the sport in India. So thank you so much for this wonderful session that you gave to our uh, to the participants. I'd like to thank uh, Rishirat sir because most of the others, especially from the from those uh, of the panelists, sir is a person who's a man of action. I'm a great fan of his. He visits one school each day, and children love him. A person who is a practical person, a person doesn't simply preach, but he practices what he preach. And I find as uh, somebody was saying, speaking out, I've seen in certain instances how he changes and how he gets. So, can I speak? I have a small suggestion. Now, for uh, all the respectful, for the respectful ladies, they are all sitting here, and for others also. you may find it slightly spoken in a, maybe you may be thinking that i may be speaking in very light vein this coach is nuisance if we want to curtail so it seems that this is a problem all over the world i have a suggestion that why the coach we should be we should make it compulsory for the coach to take his wife compulsorily with him wherever he goes <laughs> let his wife travel with him if he is training them at the particular city at least let us visit that training session once in a day i can tell you this may bring the problem considerably down because the lady the lady athletes or the lady players will come to know about the woman the uh, the the wife if later at the back of his wife he tries to play funny with any of these women they will reach out to the wife that is for sure <laughs> yes a small suggestion thank you thank you sir thank you so much sir for your valuable presence indeed i know it's been being so busy a practical person helping out each and every one and trying to make this society a wonderful society thank you so much for your contribution even though sir is not from this kerala he is from uh, rajasthan but basically now he's a keralite is trying to protect and uh, uh, and thank you so much sir for being with us and is a very close friend a fitness freak promoting fitness and i i don't know what else to say because uh, sir is a is a role model and example and he's a real hero where i think i need to salute sir for that thank you so much sir for your valuable presence i like to thank kluka i always say the light coming kluka thank you so much because each day now we are we almost coming to the end of the session thank you so much early morning it's 6:30 and darlin is there sitting with us and supporting this particular venture thank you so much kluka i'd like to thank rosa rosa is a president and she is one who got 
the world into this. And now this has become an international platform. For the past 26 days, we've been having all international speakers. Rosa, thank you so much for bringing the world to us. Even though we could not go, you saw that that was possible. Thank you, Rosa. I'd like to thank Britus, Beatrice, anthropologists, great anthropologists. You're so, your questions are really great. I always say that. There's something so tricky. Each time you'll come out something new. Thank you so much. Maria, I think only the problem was we couldn't hear you. Maria from Brazil, thank you so much, Maria. You, even though you put the note on, we saw your presence. It did grace this occasion. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank Dr. G. Kishosa for his valuable presence. And for all the panelists, I could tell you, uh, we are indeed very lucky to have a person like him as a leader, and especially support for the women folk. Anything small, you bring it as notice, he sees that it's done. That's the best part of it. So I think it's such a safe center. This center is very safe in that perspective. So I think we are safe in the hands of uh, leader, Dr. Giclo. Thank you so much, sir. I'd like to thank all the participants, administrators, and all the participants, invited guests, and also Dr. Sanjay Prajapati for his presence. So once again, thank you one and all. Before we wind up, tomorrow we have a very important session, very important speaker, Gudrin, uh, who's from the uh, German Olympic delegation. She's going to be with us. So I think of all the, the, the greatest of our, uh, uh, our heroine will be there tomorrow for the session. So I request each one to join. Thank you so much and namaste. Thank you, sir. Namaste. Namaste. Oh, Rosa, it's wonderful. We're going to have a workshop. Rosa, we'll work out for a workshop. Workshop. Okay. Yeah. yeah. A series where you can think of starting. How can we take up a policy? We are going to type that. Definitely talk to Kishosa. And with time, we'll think what's possible. And definitely, we, you can help us in doing things better. Of course. Thanks. That's great, great. So it's a first step, and you made it possible. I wanted this, this topic, and you made that possible. Thank you so much. And uh, click on. I saw the question. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Namaste. Okay. Namaste. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, please be in touch. Tomorrow, I hope you all will join us because we all would like you all to be there for tomorrow's session too. Thank you, Kishore. Thank you, Sanjay Prajapati. Thank you so much.